Hello and welcome to the third webinar in the Media Soft Rotaire series, an initiative by the Department of Media Science, the Heritage Academy. Today, we are delighted to have with us Dr. Daya Thusu, Professor of International Communication at the Department of Journalism, School of Communication, Hong Kong Baptist University. Being an author or editor of 18 books and counting, his latest publication is titled Bricks Media, Reshaping the Global Communication Order. Dr. Thusu is also the founder and manager Edit of Global Media and Communication, an academic journal published by SAGE. Professor Thusu has also had a long association with the University of Westminster, United Kingdom as Professor of International Communication, Co-Director of India Media Center, and Advisor to the China Media Center. He was also Distinguished Visiting Professor and Inaugural Chair at Disney Chair in Global Media 2018-19 at Schwarzman University, Tsinghua University, Beijing. With a PhD in international relations from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, he worked as a journalist both in India and the UK for organizations like Press Trust of India and the Germany News Service. Sir, it is our great pleasure and honor to humbly welcome you. Before we proceed further, I'd like to invite uh, our principal, Dr. Gaur Banerjee, the principal of the Heritage Academy, to kindly say a few words. So, Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to the team media science, including members of faculty and students for organizing third webinar on global communication paradigm and changing face of news as a part of the webinar series, Media Science Frontiers. Today's webinar will be, will be taken up by None else than a renowned speaker, Dr. Dayathusu, Professor of International Communication, Department of Journalism, School of Communication, Hong Kong Baptist University. Sir, we are honored that in spite of your very, very busy schedule, you could find out some time for us, for our students and members of faculty and other dignified guests present today. This type of initiative will certainly be of great help not only for the students, but also members of faculty and industry professionals in extending their horizon in the field of changing face of news on account of paradigm shift in the philosophy and understanding of global communication. With the help of the deliberation by speakers of eminence in this webinar, I'm sure there will be a lot, of to, lot to take away for each one of us. I strongly believe that such initiative could be possible only by virtue of a team of dedicated, highly skilled members of faculty under the dynamic leadership of Dean Media Science Professor Dr. Modupa Boxi. I always say we are proud of the team Media Science, not only because of their exemplary performances, but also whenever they do something, there is a lot of creativity in it. A big salute to you all. I feel honored to express my gratitude to our respected Chief Executive Officer, Kalan Bharati Trust, Sri Pradeep Kumar Agarwal, sir, who is always a source of continuous support, encouragement, and inspiration for all of us in Heritage Group of Institution. I further like to thank Director Kalan Bharati Trust, Mr. Pravi Roy, for his valuable guidance. Last but not the least, I welcome all the distinguished dignitaries and our beloved students who are always the backbone of success of the Heritage Academy for their presence in all the program. Whenever there is any opportunity to speak about the Academy, uh, particularly this is for information of Mr. Uh, Dr. Thusu, uh, we started our journey way back in 2006. The concept how to start a college like this was conceived by none else than our chairman, honorable chairman, uh, C.H.K. Chaudhary, sir. It was set up in 2007 with two steams, BBA and BCA. Gradually, with the increase of intake in BBA and BCA, and with the introduction of prestigious media science department under the stewardship of Madhupa Bakshi, 
our student toll at present rose to 1000 and the college is one of the best performing college in terms of academic performance placement and overall holistic development it is being rated as one of the best college under our university system i would also like to state that our students have not only come out with generally good result but they are the topper gold medalist in university results they are also getting very good placement particularly masters in media science course students are making us always proud and we have also very good performance in terms of placement in bca category in any case dr daya i i know for certain students are eagerly waiting to listen to you therefore i will not extend my welcome talk god bless you all jai hind thank you dr bakshi to kindly say a few words yes uh, thank you principal sir, sir for your kind words you are always very uh, uh, st uh, uh, strong background for us and you always support our programs and uh, as we conceive as we go we try to keep up with the media that is happening and one of the efforts is to media science frontiers is to bring in professors from all around the country as they are pointed out that this is one of the advantages of covid that we have been able to reach out to professors from different domains in different countries we so far we have had one from new zealand we have had one one from uh, usa uh, we are looking forward to again one from uk so this is our way of there we reaching out to the global professors also giving a dimension of how communication is studied in the different universities around the world to our student what uh, uh, lenses they should put on when they are looking at communication throughout the world and thank you daya again for giving um, time to us at such a short notice i have a lot of my faculties who are also waiting to hear you they are very excited that such a senior professor is part of our program and we look forward to hearing you along with our students thank you thank you thank you so much um, um, for this opportunity i um as i said before it's a, it's, a, it's a great um mechanism to try to broaden our syllabus open up kind of vistas that our faculty and students may not be exposed to i think it is particularly important in our field in the communication media field which is relatively new field um, in india particularly so and also um, my sense of um, this, this, the discipline in India is that it's still very um, much focused towards application in terms of jobs and you know journalism or public relations or not enough um, context or theory uh, and I think that's where uh, these kinds of webinars become very important because um, you get a, a, a kind of outsider's perspective in my case it's not really outsiders because Although I've lived out of India for now 30 plus years, I still carry an Indian passport and I'm uh, very Indian in my thoughts and, and approaches. Um, but when you are looking at it from, a, from outside, you get a slightly more nuanced view because you have something to compare it with. So I spent 30 years in London and you get a certain perspective, which is Western, you know, um, and then you move to this part of the world, as I did. I was in Beijing for a year, and uh, I've been here for more than a year now in Hong Kong. And then you look at the world differently, because there are distinct ways of looking at the world. Uh, and I think as, as somebody who does international communication, that's that's a great honor and, and opportunity to able to see that um, comparison um, and learn from it. So um, what I thought I'll do today is I, I have got about I sort of a half an hour to present, and I'm normally um, using Zoom, so I'm not that used to um, Google Meet. I hear it's not as user friendly as Zoom. So, but I, I'll try. I'll, I'll try to um, 
present and then I can talk through my, my slides. Um, how do I do this? Um, Mansi can help you. If you want, Mansi can present for you. It would be better if I could do it myself, but I'm just trying to see how. There, there's a, there is a present now button. On the bottom yes, right. I clicked on that. But how do I? Oh, do I need to? Do you need to allow me to share or something? Like in Zoom, you have to allow. Yeah. No, I don't think that's necessary. You okay. can go to your. So when I go to present, what do I press? It says your entire screen, a window, a, your, a window. Do it window so that a you window. can see. Okay. And then what happens? Share. Yes. Uh, then you uh, do your. Yeah. Go ahead, Mansi. Select uh, the PowerPoint presentation, sir. If it's open. On your uh, it is system. open, yes. Yes, sir. Uh, after selecting a window, you can just uh, double click on the PowerPoint presentation and it will share the screen. Okay, I'm doing it. Why is it? Can you see it? Not no? yet. Okay, right there it is. Can you see it now? Yes, sir. Okay, excellent. Good. Thank you. Um, so what I'm what I'm going to do is. Uh, provide a, a kind of overview of what is happening in the world of communication globally. Now, that's a big ask, but I'll just try to provide some pointers uh, in relation to specifically news media. Um, I'll start with the, a bit of background, you know, where we are coming from in terms of global news media. I will then talk briefly about how that system, which has been in place for over 150 years, has been challenged, first by other um, poles of media power that have emerged in the last um, two decades. And finally, I want to talk about how digitization, how the internet is fundamentally challenging that order and um, how that impacts on news media and also more broadly in communication. Um, and where does India fit into it? I, I'll have some uh, reference to that as well. And uh, hopefully we'll have enough um, time for um, discussion of the provocations and questions that I might uh, raise in my, in my presentation. So if you think of the, 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 the system, as it were, a global news media system, the system was set in place in the 19th century. Um, that system speaks in English. That system has deep colonial connections. It is no coincidence that even in 2021, the most important language of global communication and media is English. Um, and both United States and UK continue to be uh, very, very dominant players in global news arena, especially. Um, so if you look at um, this slide, different genres of news media, whether it is financial newspapers, whether it are news agencies, international newspapers, radio, news magazines. Um, what we have is a clear US domination, but UK still is an important player in that. Um, if you think of the BBC, for instance, think of the Reuters, um, think of even Economist, you know, although usually influential, is not a popular magazine in that sense, but has a huge influence globally. In fact, more than half of its sale is outside, um, no, sorry, 80% of outside UK, 50% of that is in the United States. Um, so a British sociologist called this um, news duopoly, not monopoly, because it's not just the US which dominates, although that is the more dominant of these two countries, uh, UK still remains an important uh, player. Now, that obviously has implications in terms of how it projects the world, or 
represents the world or covers the world. Um, unlike other countries, these countries also have deep interests, geopolitical, economic, uh, cultural, in various parts of the globe, primarily because of the colonial history. Um, and that gives them a, a start, as it were, a, an advantage over, say, German press or French publications or Chinese or Russian or Japanese. Now, I'm talking about these, which are serious countries with highly sophisticated media systems, but they do not have the kind of reach and influence of the Anglo American media. So, what does it, why does it matter? Essentially, two words kind of summarize the problem uh, dominance and dependence. And remember, I'm talking about global media, global news. I'm not talking about domestic news. Domestic news in most countries is domestic, and that's not the, the focus of my talk today. Um, it's the foreign news, international news. So, how do Indians know about China or Brazil? Or how do Brazilians know about Kenya? What is the mechanism through which they get information? Um, they don't have correspondence there, so they're getting a Reuters copy or an AP copy, or they're watching CNN, or they have read something in the in the Time magazine, and that sort of influences the way people think about uh, the rest of the world. I'm talking about obviously elite media, and uh, because to to read the Economist or the Time or the Guardian, you have to be educated to certain. Um, level and also have certain understanding of international affairs. Um, so this Anglo-American media then has the capacity to set the global news agenda. Now, on, on any given day, um, thousands of events take place around the world. Somebody or a group of people makes the decision that out of these 5,000 stories, we are going to pick up 20. Right, And um, if you are a Reuters or if you are uh, a New York Times and you have you pick certain stories, these stories are not just confined to your local readership. They, I mean, Reuters is a global agency anyway. But even New York Times has now, since digitization has happened, millions of readers outside the United States. Uh, so you have the capacity to tell the world what is important that's happened in, in today's uh, news arena. Um, and as I said before, they're not in a kind of objective, uh, ideal party. They are, you know, the government certainly are, certainly are involved in, in various, uh, they have very clearly defined interests. Uh, and these organizations, um, they have a kind of reach and influence um, also because they are highly professional. Um, you know, Reuters was set up in 1840s, um, so they've been, sorry, 1850s, they've been in the business for a very long time, and they have certain um, factual accuracy that you can, you know, if it's a Reuters story, it cannot be factually wrong. There might be contextual accuracy issues and interpretation issues, which is what um, creates problems. For instance, um, how they cover certain parts of the world uh, and ignore others, how certain wars, conflicts get wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Remember, you know, Syria was big, and before that, Libya was big, before that, Iraq was big. They've all disappeared from news agendas today. Um, as you probably know, in Libya, there are two parallel governments but it's you know the west is out of it and they've got what they wanted um and it's, it's just gone um similarly civil conflicts uh certain gets certain conflicts hong kong where i'm based today is an interesting case because if you remember 2019 this was like every day hong kong was on international news uh, priority and in fact um Fortunately, only one person died in that uh, whole uh, year-long protest. In the same period, there were dozens and dozens of much more violent anti-government 
uh, protests around the world, including in Baghdad, where in one week more than 100 people were killed. But that didn't get the kind of coverage that Hong Kong did, because Hong Kong has a certain geopolitical value for Western media. Um, so they have then, therefore, a capacity to shape the public opinion. So the idea of public sphere, which is associated with uh, Habermas, um, now is argued with, with, with globalization, with the internet, it, it has really become a global public sphere. And if you have certain countries, certain organizations in these countries who have the capacity to set the global agenda and influence the, the geopolitics, that's what will then lead to, um, um, you know, how public opinion will be shaped. Now, that's been the case, you might say, for a very long time. Um, most of the organizations I mentioned in the previous slide, apart from BuzzFeed, which is recent, uh, most of these are well-established uh, professional global operators. Um, and their, uh, you know, dominance or, or dependence of other media organizations in many countries on these uh, networks is well established, well recorded, etc. What is interesting is uh, a kind of um, challenge to that order. And if you look at television news alone, and television, despite extraordinary growth of the internet, and I'll come to that later, uh, television still remains a very, very powerful medium because visuals carry their own language. And if you wanted to read The Guardian, you have to be, as I said, you have to be educated to a certain, to a certain level, but for visuals, it doesn't require that. So much wider reach and therefore much wider influence. So it's no wonder that various countries have already got their own 24-7 news channels in English. And if you look at this slide, we're talking of very diverse countries, RT, Russia, CGT, and Chinese, uh, France 24, French, Press TV, um, Iranian, TRT World, um, Turkish, Al Jazeera, Qatari, iNews is Israeli, NDTV, you all know, um, and NHK, Japanese, Deutsche Welle, German. Now, all of these are available in English language as well. Telesur is a um, pan Latin American network, which is based in Venezuela, of course, with uh, the political trouble there is not as important as it used to be, but it, it, its claim to fame it was the first um, pan Latin American news network. So, these networks, to varying degrees, are providing a different perspective. Of course, the, the Chinese network of, has a very different approach. Russian is mu much more anti-Western in its uh, kind of approach. So is the Press TV. Uh, and Al Jazeera, uh, again, has a certain constituency and, and uh, provides a, a slight, I, I would argue, a really interesting um, perspective on global affairs. It claims to be privileging the global south, although, you know, that's arguable. Um, but the point is that there is a, 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 a counter argument now available for the uh, people who are interested. Now, if you look at this, with only exception of NDTV, the rest of these are state-supported broadcasters. So essentially, they are getting money from their respective governments. So if tomorrow CGTN, which is China Global Television Network, quite a big one, if the Chinese government was to stop uh, funding them, they will not survive in a marketplace which is viciously competitive. Uh, as you know, India is a fantastic case of how bad that competition is. But this is a global phenomenon. And again, that idea of a commercialized, professional but commercialized news media has its origins in the United States, where in recent years, as we've seen in case of Mr. Trump's presidency, um, the, the news media actually benefited hugely by having a president whose claim to fame was a reality TV show who had never held 
um, public office in his life. Um, you know, and it shows the kind of influence of show business into supposedly serious journalism. Um, of course, Ronald Reagan was president twice. He was elected president, but he had been uh, prior to that. He had been governor of um, California. If California was a country in those days, it would have been the fourth or fifth largest economy in the world. So Mr. Reagan had some experience of public office, unlike Mr. Trump, who had none. And if it was it was not for COVID, I wouldn't be I wouldn't have been surprised if he had won again. Now this is something which I have been uh, sort of looking at uh, for many many years. In fact, I did a book uh, way back in 2007, so that's what 13 years ago. I simply called it news as entertainment, um, and I called it global infotainment, the rise of global infotainment, how increasingly news and entertainment are mixing and creating kind of hybrid system of news media. And there are various reasons the, the book is, has got all the details. I'm not going to go into detail. But just to pick um, a few points that this has really undermined the public aspects of media everywhere in the world, even in the UK, where there's a very strong tradition of public service broadcasting, um, exemplified by the BBC, which some of you may know, still in 2021, does not have any advertising on its radio, television, or even website. Uh, what you see in India, the, inter the international version, is that is uh, that has advertising, but the domestic BBC even today doesn't have advertising, which is a remarkable fact. But even they are feeling increasingly hostage to the market forces and the notion of private profit. Uh, all across Eastern Europe, um, so former Soviet Union and China also, people don't really, outside of China, understand. A lot of Chinese media, especially in, at the regional level, is deeply commercially influenced and advertising is very important. And beyond news and, you know, kind of protocol, which the Communist Party wants to promote, there's a lot else happening in the media space, which is essentially commercially driven. And of course, the best example of that is our own country. Uh, so in this book, I had a chapter I, of what was happening to the news. I called it Bollywoodization of news, which I thought was actually uh, quite an apt term to describe a phenomena, which um, I'm sad to say, but in a way happy to su suggest that I had predicted way back in 2006 when I was writing the book. Uh, today, when you see this uh, Sushant Singh case, for instance, uh, you know, it, it just um, exemplifies it brilliantly. Um, so India is, in many ways, uh, it has borrowed uh, some of the worst aspects of um, Western uh, journalism and media uh, in a country where there actually was highly sophisticated media system. I grew up and worked in media in India. And, um, you know, one had uh, from Panchichang, Panchichang, uh, Panch, uh, what is it called, Panchichang, what is the RSS paper called, I forget, Panchichang, sorry, from Panchichang to Patriot on the left, there was a whole spectrum of opinion, and they existed uh, in perfect, not perfect harmony, but a reasonable amount of harmony. Um, and that also, if you think of the, the spectrum that they offered to an educated Indian uh, was remarkable. And then you had a fantastic, you know, regional press. I mean, of course, I'm speaking to people in Kolkata, which has the most um, sophisticated history of uh, not just political journalism, but cultural journalism and creative journalism, which is unsurpassed even today in the rest of India, indeed globally. Um, so what do we have today now instead? We have a, a, a deeply divided, a, a partisan media, um, which is polarized to the extent that you feel that you are, you know, um, just think of what was the TV's coverage, not everybody, but a large section of TV, 
uh, during the beginning of Corona crisis when it was identified with one particular community. Um, and mind you, these are not some kind of um, uh, extreme channels. News 18 is part of Mr. Reliance's uh, media empire. It's, it's a very, very important news network in India. So is your own uh, Star News, which is, you know, Kolkata has a very good connection with that. So we're talking about national news organizations, and they took this position, and um, we sort of wonder why. Anyway, why is a different question. We can perhaps discuss that later. And then you have um, this very overtly nationalist um, narrative being uh, voiced every, or shouted every evening on national television. And as you see on this this uh, graph, you have I don't know, 2, 4, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15 people, including the anchor, who speaks most of the time, as you know. Um, and I don't, I mean, I sometimes watch it for fun, and it is interesting to see how the debate in India, which had a very uh, long history, you know, Amrita Sen famously said that we are a very argumentative people. Um, but the, the, the defilement of that debate and debasing of conversation is actually worrying. And I worry about young people who are being exposed to that debate, which not only lowers the, the kind of level of understanding, um, it also is toxic in terms of what it can do to social harmony and is doing to social harmony in a country as diverse and difficult as India. Um, given this background, what is even more interesting and at the same time worrying is the uh, extraordinary growth of the internet and uh, how digitization has changed everything, including news media. So this old structures which have dominated this global system way back from 19th, 19th century that is increasingly being um, you know influenced by by new forces of course even in the digital space there are the big masters uh, the apples of the world and the uh, you know googles of the world and the facebooks of the world and that's indicative also of how much money they are making i just got some data together for this presentation um total Global digital ad spend is now something in the range of $333 billion. This is last year's figures, the beginning of last year. And this year has been, last year has been a very unusual year for digital companies. They made a huge amount of money because of the you know, situation. So the figure for this year must be even higher. Um, but if you look at, so out of that, one third almost is Google and then Facebook. Um, but also Alibaba is pretty big. In fact, in that particular uh, month, which was January 2020, I think it was, um, it was higher, in fact, double that of Amazon. Um, so a lot of uh, resources are uh, associated with this. A lot of money is involved, and that is creating a new set of problems and possibilities, you know, a lot of uh, incredible uh, potential of democratizing news, um, you know, giving voice to people who had no access, uh, who were not part of that narrative. So challenging that elitism, that, that club that existed for a long time. But, but at the same time, you have a, um, a kind of infodemic of, of the phase which has been used by WHO in, in relation to um, the COVID uh, situation, uh, a, a major problem with um, false and fake news uh, or misinformation or disinformation, sometimes uh, by design, sometimes by accident, sometimes by not having proper systems in place, because this is an instantaneous 24-7 global news economy, uh, you know, we saw that on the 26th of December, uh, January and in Lal Kila, when some uh, news reports were suggesting that uh, it was Khalistani flag that was being hosted, which wasn't the case. 
but that went viral. Uh, a very distinguished journalist from a very well-known channel actually said that the police had shot one of the, um, the unfortunate person who died um, when his tractor uh, overturned. Um, it was tweeted and then the journalist had to apologize publicly. Uh, and this is the pressure of this 24-7 news um, you know, cycle where every second you have a deadline. And it's a very interesting couple of books I mentioned here, um, one by Philip Howard, who is, uh, who is director of the Internet Institute at Oxford University, and they're doing some interesting work uh, about this uh, menace of fake news, uh, simply called lie machines. Um, and also you have um, a more recent book uh, about uh, how to deal with, how to understand it and how to deal with fake news. Um, there's also a, issue about surveillance uh, in this digital age where our data is um, accessible and but to corporations to governments to uh, foreign governments um, and some governments as you know in case of um, the revelation of uh, Snowden in the United States a couple of years ago and Washington Post did a book about that the National Security Agency how it was not only um, spying on American citizens, but uh, globally, they were doing this extraordinary uh, spying operation. Um, one uh, Harvard professor has called this, um, this phenomena the age of surveillance capitalism, where um, we willingly or unwillingly just uh, surrender our data for free services and um, that has, again, a, a lot of um, issues uh, that we, we need to be thinking about. I, I, I say that uh, particularly in relation to young people, because I've been teaching this um, for many, many years now. And uh, most young people uh, do not worry too much about that, it seems to me. Uh, trading their privacy for free content seems to be a good bargain for them. What they also don't seem to appreciate as much as they ought to uh, is the fact that uh, each time you send a message, um, so what we're talking, you're, you're recording this, I know, but that's not what I'm saying. Even if you're not recording it, somewhere there might be a possibility of this talk being recorded. Um, each time you send a message, there's a copy somewhere. And even if you delete it, the copy remains. Uh, we've seen uh, it in so many instances. Partly because the infrastructure within which this digital communication takes place is still very much uh, controlled by a few hugely powerful companies, private companies, with close association with their government. And it's very important to understand. Um, so if we think of the browsers, for instance, I just did some research on this. Chrome, which is Google owned, is, I mean, predominant 66% almost of global share of, of browsers, followed by Safari, then Edge, then Pfizer, Samsung is Korean, but Firefox, Internet Explorer. So if we combine all that, we're talking about 90% is US based companies. And this is the global picture. Even China, which has its own infrastructure, um, is, some of these are available there. And, and all people know how to use them, even if they're not available, because they are VPNs and systems. So um, even in the, in the digital space, uh, that dominance and dependence that I mentioned earlier is visible. And that isn't surprising because the internet was developed in the United States. The um, United States set the rules. It still sort of governs it. It controls most of its economy. The electronic economy is dominated by a few companies in the United States. Um, but the usage of internet has changed profoundly. When it was privatized and globalized in mid-1990s, 
60 plus percentage of people who were using the internet were Americans. Today, that figure has shrunk to one digit. And there has been a massive expansion of internet in the developing world, especially in Asia. Look at our own country. Um, the growth has been nothing short of phenomenon. Only a country which is bigger, better in that department is China, but for various reasons. Um, I did some data crunching here. So you got top 10 internet users. This is, um, again, 2020 figures, 904 million. But the interesting point is the percentage of people who are still not online. Yeah? China, followed by India, US, Indonesia, Brazil, Nigeria, Russia, Japan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. The January 2020, sorry. So we're in, Feb we're in January 2021. So obviously that figure is redundant. <laughs> it, gets you, it gets you a trend. But the point is, it, it is millions of people are joining the digital highways every day in developing countries. So if you look at people who are not online in the United States, just 4%. In Japan, 10%. In Pakistan, 59%. In India, 46%. In China, 37%. So where is the growth going to come? Right? And um, thankfully, under Mr. Modi's stewardship, there has been a concerted effort to push this digital India agenda. And I think um, what COVID has also forced governments and corporations to do is to realize that the connectivity is fundamental. Um, just imagine if we were hit by COVID and there was no internet or its equivalent. How would we have coped? I just leave you, a, you know, a moment to think about that. Um, so what excites me about this is potential uh, for uh, doing um, things with this extraordinary connectivity, apart from fake news and you know all that, that one part, but there's also huge potential to use this connectivity for uh, you know moving on to the next stage. Um, and I think it's interesting that in the last five years there has been some very impressive growth in this area in India. Um, for example, the geo phenomena itself is, uh, future historians will wonder how within a span of four years, they reached uh, 400 million subscribers. Uh, that doesn't even happen in China. And that's the only comparison we should seriously make because you can't compare India with uh, Denmark, where 4 million people live. It's the population of Basti in India, right? So. They should be realistic about comparing countries. So within those five years now, Geo is operating in so many different um, verticals, as you see here, for financial security, technology, tech to browser, to social networking, to publishing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and trying to really get into this A league of, of organizations like Alibaba and Amazon, who've been in operation for much longer than Geo. And I think there's also a very interesting uh, convergence which has taken place between a very pro-business government um, and a, a corporate elite which understands how to deal with that government and some certain groups of that elite. And I think that that combination is working, especially in that, that arena. So what is that then it, it, this kind of infrastructure change and the, the digital possibilities, uh, what does it mean to international news? I want to just say a few words on that. And um, I'm going to finish it in, in, in a couple of more slides. Um, so what digitization has done, what this uh, availability of a merit of channels has done is that it is providing now competing news narratives on international affairs. And given the the economy, the, the uh, economy as well as ecology of, of global communication, that is actually much cheaper to communicate. You can, everybody with a smartphone is potentially a journalist. 
um, you also have this instant connectivity, you know, a video can circulate within seconds around the world, and then that upsets the, the, the traditional agenda setters of news media. So just make a few points about that. Growing global news contra flows. Um, RT mentioned earlier, Russian, JGT, and Chinese, Al Jazeera. Um, now they have distinct approaches and they represent, I would say, a serious parts of the world, Al Jazeera because of the, the, the resources that are still there in the Middle East and the kind of news rich arena that it is and is likely to remain for various reasons. China, of course, uh, now the in the next what, 28, they're saying it will be the largest economy in GDP terms in the world, uh, which is only seven years down the line. And Russia, which, which gets a bad press, um, but actually is a very, very powerful country. We shouldn't forget that. It has um, maybe 10,000 nuclear weapons. It has a huge amount of energy resources. And most importantly, it's got a lot of clean water. And next future wars are going to be about water, not about oil. And it's got both oil, uh, gas, and water. And it's very friendly to us, so we should keep those connections. And I think India does that. Um, so there are distinct approaches um, which are now accessible. And as I mentioned earlier, they're the language, which is the language of global communication. Uh, beyond these kind of uh, macro level uh, counter narratives, there's also a lot of, um, I've called it propaganda from below, um, user generated content, citizen journalism, which has flourished under this digital system and uh, particularly relevant in countries where the media systems are controlled and uh, citizen journalists have, have a very important role and they have performed that in, in various capacities. At the same time, there's also what's been called weaponization of social media. Um, this amazing connectivity has been colonized by various groups whether they are trolls, the terrorist influencers, um, they could be corporate influencers, they could be promoting a particular ideology. And there are so many um, instances where this has happened, irrespective of political systems, irrespective of the, the level of economic development or even literacy. Uh, we've seen that in, in countries across the world, uh, whether they're pursuing a particular position or, uh, you know, demonizing somebody or um, this whole idea of deep fakes and I mean, this whole variety of issues associated with this idea of weaponization. Um, we used to talk about YouTube effect. Uh, prior to that, there was a discourse about the Al Jazeera effect. And even prior to that, there was an academic discourse about the CNN effect, how the availability of 24-7 news was influencing government policy. Um, there was a lot of that written during the 90s when the, you know, the Americans bombed Iraq and the CNN became a big phenomenon. And then 2003, when they bombed it again, um, Al Jazeera had become much more important and Al Jazeera was showing pictures of the BBC, uh, footage of the BBC or CNN didn't. So people started talking about Al Jazeera effect. And since then, YouTube has become so important that there is actually a parallel narrative taking place. Um, and because it is there, you can always watch it. You know, it's not like, it's not instance, it's there. And that, that sort of, there's archival value of it, and that's an interesting phenomenon in itself. And, and then you have this whole idea of virality, and that's becoming uh, increasingly uh, almost integral to how mainstream journalism uh, operates today. Uh, and I've given you some instances from the dreadful events that happened on the 26th of, on our you know, Republic Day in our capital. Um, and partly the problems are associated with the fact that the terrain within which this is being played out, namely the digital terrain, is still under construction. It has got lots of leaks. Um, the regulatory system is not in place. And big companies do not want any system to be in place because that will curtail 
their capacity to not only make money, but also to influence politics. And we've seen so many examples of how this has been done. Um, remember Cambridge Analytica, which was a major uh, exposure uh, of this problem done by the, the Observer newspaper in London. So from WikiLeaks to Snowden to Panama Papers, and most recently in India's case, Mr. Goswami's uh, WhatsApp leaks, um, which demonstrate if there was need for it, uh, how closely he is associated with the highest uh, echelons of power in India. Um, by the way, that's not unusual. I mean, journalists do have that, but it's, it doesn't get into the public domain. And, and, and there's a story behind that, why that happened, but that's not perhaps the, the, the key uh, argument for my, my talk. But the point is the system is imperfect and the system is under construction and therefore it is it has lots of leaks. Um, as was mentioned before I started, I've uh, been working in this sort of area for many years and um, uh, I've just published a book um, which is um, about BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And this is the third book we did on, a, on this topic. It's, it's a big project uh, run by Professor Norton Strunk, who is a well-known uh, professor in uh, Finland. Um, uh, so I, I have a couple of chapters in that book, but this final chapter I wanted to just briefly mention, uh, where I was talking about what is happening in BRICS countries, given the scale of the change. Just to think of China and India, forget about the other three. Uh, you know, there's a very important change in terms of media uh, and digitization and the internet. So I was arguing a case for de-Americanizing the internet and how do we, how do we, how do you visualize that? That's something I'm working on in a, in a book length uh, project and that will take some time to come out maybe a couple of years and I've got something else to finish before that. So let me just then um, finish with some kind of reflections of looking ahead uh, to what, what kind of uh, paradigms there might be to think about. Um, I, I called it um, post-COVID world. I, I, I know it's not going to be anytime very soon, but we will get uh, at a stage where there will be, a, it's already beginning to happen. Thankfully, India is doing well in that department, we, numbers have come down considerably, and we have two vaccines in operation. I'm sure there will be the Russian one too soon. Um, so in some ways, we are actually um, going back to, uh, in, look at the global picture, um, a Cold War kind of logic, where um, it was the Russians versus the Americans, the, this, you know, the bipolarity of the world, which is of course stupid because you know India was not bipolar. India was you know <laughs> not a line system. China was out of it way back in the 1950s. But that myth was continued that there is this kind of um, you know Moscow versus Washington warfare. Everybody has has to adjust around it. Uh, something similar is being constructed vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Um, because China has arrived at a stage when it is beginning to challenge the status quo and nobody wants to, uh, you know, lose that privilege. Uh, certainly not the United States. Um, so some of the issues that are likely to emerge, some have already emerged and are likely to become more contested. Uh, I want to just focus on those. Um, Cyber sovereignty and data localization. Um, some of you may remember, um, I think it's two years ago, um, maybe it was last year sometime, um, Mr. Uh, Ambani in a public meeting in Ahmedabad, I think it was, and the Prime Minister was sharing the dais with him, and he said that, you know, we want to end this data. Um, colonization. Our data is with American companies and we need to have our own systems. 
Now that's something uh, coming from the person who essentially dominates India's internet space and has other very important uh, you know, assets, whether it's telecommunication, whether it is energy, etc. Um, I, I think that's an interesting, in my view, interesting development because India has the, after China, the largest number of data and is the cheapest data in the world. And if data is new oil, um, where should it be stored? And the idea of data sovereignty is very important. And it's not just about the Facebooks of the world. If you remember, um, TikTok, was, TikTok was banned in India and the Chinese are very worried because they were taking hoovering of data from India. Um, uh, we, we, are, we, have to yet, we have yet to develop a kind of um, you know, infrastructure for uh, uh, localizing and, and, and um, archiving our data. Um, so that's one area where um, we have a, a lot more contestation in, in coming um, years and decades as, as the economist cover says the battle for digital supremacy because everything is moving into that space anyway. So who is in control there becomes very important. Um, digital Cold War, um, IoT which is Internet of Things. And of course, artificial intelligence, which is uh, again a very contested arena, and uh, countries like China, uh, United States, of course, um, and some others have been investing heavily in this. Um, uh, if you think of 5G technology and the fight over that between the US and China and Europeans and China, it's interesting because China is ahead of um, most other countries in that department. And uh, they have uh, very heavily invested in it because this is not just about mobile telephony, it's about Internet of Things, and that's a different level of digital experience. Um, also, uh, I, I sort of alluded to this point earlier about uh, how this digital connectivity can also lead to developmental uh, projects. Uh, if you think of the JAM uh, Trinity that uh, Arvind Subramanyam introduced to India, um, you know, Jandhan, Yojana, Mobile, Aadhaar, that was a, uh, it was extremely important. Uh, maybe not for people like you and me, but people at the bottom of our social strata. And if there wasn't that infrastructure in place and COVID had hit us, it would have been far, far, far worse. Um, the Chinese have done even better in that department. We have, uh, that's the thing about earlier, when you are actually in a different location, then you see and you make those comparisons. And uh, they have done, uh, they announced uh, last month, I think, that they have uh, now eliminated extreme poverty in their country. Uh, we still have uh, millions of people who live in extreme poverty, and, and arguably, uh, COVID has actually accelerated that process. As, is, as it has done in many other countries. Um, finally, then, we, we talk about uh, all this that I've mentioned really is connected broadly in, with this phenomenon of globalization, opening up of markets, deregulation, privatization, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what COVID also did was to make us rethink whether um, such dependence on foreign origin, uh, you know, content, whether it's, it's medicine or it's medical care or whatever, is a wise thing to do. And therefore, there has been a, a, a discussion in various circles about what is described sometimes as deglobalization, uh, whether it is America first in the United States or it's Brexit in the UK, or it is, uh, you know, Atmanirbhar Bharat in case of India, there is a, a, a lot of debate going on in this uh, you know, COVID situation about self-reliance. And I think India has a very good record of that. Traditionally, we built everything, you know, from uh, the Brits left us, we, we had nothing. We built everything from scratch. Of course, not of great quality, but it was there. People now, you know, why should <laughs> gods and goddesses made in China? I never understood that. Um, so, deglobalization, and then perhaps this is 
um, something I'm working on, leading to de-Americanizing the internet, because um, the Chinese have done it. I think India is the next uh, in that queue, because we, we have to develop uh, an infrastructure, which is Desi. Uh, we have the expertise, we have uh, the numbers, we have in the next five years, we'll be a billion plus internet users. Uh, India has the largest number of WhatsApp users, largest numbers of um, Facebook, etc., etc. And I sometimes wonder why haven't we developed our own Google? Why haven't we developed our own Facebook when our people are heading some of these top organizations? So somewhere something is amiss. Um, I mean, I'll leave you with that thought and I will stop there. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it useful. I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm happy to take questions and comments. No. Dr. Dev, you had some time in your hand. It's three o'clock, so 15 minutes. If we, uh, if it extends to for our questionnaire, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm, I'm okay. I've got time. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, Manji, yes. Uh, Ma'am, I'd request you and Professor Chatterjee to kindly take over and conduct the questions. Uh, I will uh, keep this uh, session a little short because we are running out of time. So maybe 10 minutes we take and then we put on the question, students' questions. Yes, uh, Arjun, you lead it the way. Thank you, Dr. Bakshi. Thank you, Professor Dayatosun. It was a fantastic presentation. So, sorry, Arjun, I can't, I can't hear you very well. Can you raise Can you your hear volume? Me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, but it's very faint. I think again, it's the Internet of Things. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll be closer to the mic. Okay. And then I'll also be closer to the mic as, as close as we can get in virtual space. But thank you for that fantastic presentation, sir. Uh, indeed, it's a, it's a varied topic, and I don't think 15 minutes is good enough time for a, even to start a question. But I have one question for you, uh, which I am being a journalist working with the BBC. I ask you this. The recent trend is all the international media across the world are trying to penetrate into regional languages. The internet has a language of its own. I mean, barring the Chinese who use Mandarin or a few other nations, how important is it to linguistically be non-democratic to try and avoid this, what do you call deglobalization or de-Americanization -Americ of the internet? Um, thank you. That's that's a really good question. Actually, one of the biggest area of growth uh, in digital space is also in regional languages, not in English, in India, for instance. And that's a trend you see in many, many other countries. Um, and, you know, why not? The point, now we have the systems where you can tr you can translate into various languages through, you know, uh, there are mechanisms for that. Um, so I think that trend is going to to grow, and it's not just the BBC. All major, you know, the, the media companies do have very clearly defined uh, regional um, strategies. They have local staff. Um, you know, it was. I mean, I'm old enough to remember. It used to be always uh, white men of certain age and education who were telling you about what was wrong in India or what was wrong in Africa or in Iran. Today they have, in, in most cases, they've been replaced by local journalists because they need that kind of uh, more nuanced understanding of what was happen is happening because the competition is also wide. So I think that is a trend which is likely to grow. And that also means that the, this, this sort of hegemony that existed for so long is increasingly being challenged. Just think of BBC in India, for instance. What is the number of people who watch it regularly? It's ministry. Very it's ministry, exactly. right? right? China, there is no BBC, except in five-star hotels. Mm. Uh, US has its own version of news media. Yeah. Latin America, it is <laughs> not present. Arabs have their own Al Jazeera variety. Europeans have their own. Africa, the Chinese are going in. So where is the BBC? Right? Because we've been colonized. We've been told that that is the best medium in the world it is wonderful i'm not i, I you know i, I, I 
but the point is that it, it, it that old system is deeply uh, being challenged and i think uh, is more likely to be um the, the answer is to have our own why, why isn't india uh, in the global news space why we there in bollywood but not in news media we have the advantage of english language we have the advantage of you know uh, a very professional journalism which goes back quite a long time times of india was established in 1838 right so there are like 10 generation of people who worked in english language the first so called journalist was from this city where we are all sitting and talking dr uh, i mean you know about it raja ramon roy yes and that brings me to my second question which is a corollary to this which is if you are talking about bringing in new languages regional languages the vernaculars yeah you need to employ or have people or journalists who speak write read that language and communicate in it yeah. to combat with such entities it is absolutely very very easy for big corporates you mentioned in your speech about our money and the prime minister modi sharing the this and talking about how we have to be free from this space that was i remember before the launch of geo in india so how do we cope up with this because the journalist in the village who speaks in bengali or mandarin or any other regional language pari pali whatever is very vulnerable to this what is your understanding of this um i i wouldn't be very um comfortable in answering that question because i don't know how um it works at that sort of very local level um but i think if you think of these big companies so the reliance is a good case in point if you think at uh, think of their um tv 18 network and how they basically took over all the regional major rivals around the, around the country and now they have this network but um i i do think you know for the for moving to the next level you de- do need those kinds of resources in a country of the size of india because the state doesn't have those and um you know it, it and you cannot be dependent on foreign money for this kind of so there has to be something which is and it's one of the one of the tragedies of india that we have not really um appreciated this kind of potential that uh, our enterprise has a lot of young indians have fantastic ideas about how to move to the next stage but we tend to um you know still there is a kind of status view of how we should deal with it that is not to say that state is not important we have seen in covid it is the state which has done everything not the corporates right mm-hmm. they have they have provided food to the, the, the poorest um so uh, it's is getting that balance right you see i think that there is a um, um what has happened in the last few decades is that we move to this whole open market argument everything has to be done by the market market is more efficient and state is corrupt and inefficient etc etc we need to get it at some right level because uh, the state has a very very important role um and i think one of the things that i have learned uh, being in china i was there for a year was that they have two structures they have the party structure going down to the village level and then you have the bureaucracy going down to the village level and that works because the system is such it works um you know in in conjunction and that then you see the road is built or you know things have are done um we don't have that the the, the party structure is in there because we have multi party systems and we have antagonistic parties and the bureaucracy has been enfeebled so much and politicized so much especially at the provincial level right so the system is deeply problematic i'll also ask dr bakshi to have a few because our students are yes. asking a lot of questions yes i have two questions you talk yes. of the de- americanization yes. uh, when we talk about de americanization and it links with Hello. this is the fact that we need to do our own theory building Mm-hmm. our own again okay. now when we look at theory building one of the greatest uh, problems that we face is that where do we start yeah ekoda hai ekoda i think my my answer to that would be um history 
okay do we go back to our own system no, no. of uh, let's say the no, no. vedas and those do we go back as back as that no, no. because uh, or do we look at uh, basically somewhere around 12th 13th no, no. century because 12th 13th century is when we are actually utilizing communication more effectively rather than before that so we have our own town crier system and uh, those beyond 12th 13th century right so it's not just that going that far back i mean of course one should because that's very important to give especially the younger generation a sense of continuity that there is actually a um, you know there's a very famous uh, book about uh, the so called sacred geography of india there is a kind of connection with the way temples are built across the country and there's a, there's a logic to it it's not done you know alpha uh, it's not done in kind of half a third way there is a history behind it the tragedy is that we have a lot of talk about that in uh, the current environment in india for the last 5 years but there is no work so i'm still waiting for a decent book which has come out in the last 5 years which actually you know gives our young people a a a compendium of what we have achieved in not in a kind of um, you know um, so it, this is this is a, this is a this is a very long term project and it requires a lot of good people getting together over a period of time to come up with a framework when you think of western theories they didn't come out in one day or one decade is a whole history and um, as i was saying earlier in relation to our field particularly is such a new field and we have uh, we are we are not really giving the kind of uh, importance to context theory history etc to our students uh, i was actually in uh, i think i met you with madhupa there i was at the azad uh, molana azad academic i was in mayful con uh, conference there and i i did say that a lot of young people wouldn't know who molana azad was right so um i think there is something at the same time there is so much more information available today you go to you just type up molana azad and you got everything his books and his biography in, in 30 seconds so when i was there that age we didn't have that access so I, i think it's is this this connectivity provides a lot of also for for people like us for academics to uh, you know um, have these conversations i think what you're asking is a fundamentally important point but that requires a much uh, you know it requires several agreed agreed conversation i agree I, but, but as i said at the beginning the answer my, my answer would be to do history more seriously Uh, one okay. of the problems in our field is that it's very ahistorical. Yes. Right. So I'll tell you. Yesterday, or day, no, sorry, day, two days ago, I went to a little temple here. It was a Buddhist temple. And what do I find there? I found a statue of Hanuman. I said, "But Hanuman, yeah, Hanuman, what is he doing?" Now, where is the as a communication scholar? Say, how did it get here? Was it the 19th century? So no, no, this temple. There was a temple here which is very old. before the brits came here before this was a village so i i think there is a lot that um, we have uh, to do and um, i think history would be a good starting point not in a kind of vulgar you know nationalistic kind of history no 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 um, it's slightly more nuanced uh, history yeah and in your book there is somebody is talking about mandala yes yes because, because i was just reading it That, that, that it's interesting they they are both uh, finnish scholars and um, you know from finland um and um, they discovered chanakya and they were using that to uh, but it's it's not uh, you know so that's just one example there's so much more you know uh, it's unfortunate that we have not really um, uh, kind of i have one quick question this is again your last slide you talk about because this is what i heard in the international communication association uh, uh, conference that i was there last year uh, iot uh, uh, artificial intelligence yeah. uh, virtual reality they were saying that journalism is going to be replaced it is going to be more of the machines and what do you think of that because you are talking about the future absolutely it's already beginning to happen if you remember in during the brazil olympics 
AP, Associated Press, was a major news agency. They were actually using AI to produce sporting stories because you just put the data and then bring out the story about you know who scored one and what, etc. Where I am at Hong Kong Baptist University, we, we have a very big journalism school. In fact, the oldest school in Hong Kong. And we have a dedicated uh, section where people, younger people especially, are working on AI and journalism. So there's a lot of work being done on that. And uh, my worry, I mean, I am not, you know, a different generation, but what worries me is that if machines start um, thinking about how a society should operate, how should we should think, how we should, what should we read, and how we should, what sort of music we should listen to, then there is a problem. So it's, it's, it's it, you know, it can be very efficient in certain ways, but also it can be quite um, problematic because when it gets to aesthetics and philosophy and, and sort of higher planes of human existence, it doesn't do that. It does very functional things. Um, and that's one of the problems that I face, especially here in East Asia, where there, there's a lot of emphasis on that. So it's increasingly becoming a technologically driven society where um, if you say anything which is slightly at a different level, they say, well, that's a philosophical question, right? They, because... So th we have to be ready for that's coming. Yes, Hello? sir. Hello, I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, while, while appreciating uh, quite highly informative and valuable academic deliberation, I have a very small question. It may not be very relevant to the context, but it appears to me to ask you because when somebody of your stature is, we, I must ask something questions like this. Uh, what, in your opinion, is the reason of variation in perceived communication? What, in your opinion, is the reason of variation in perceived communication from the viewer's point of view and intended communication from the news channel point of view is it only on account of monetary terms or anything else um we, we're getting into a, a very in thank you that's a very interesting question because that's really about um what in media studies sometimes is called media effects you know how does it you know what is the relationship between the producers and the consumers um, and there are various views on that. One is that you actually construct, you create audiences. Um, you know, Mr. Goswami's channel is a good case in point. Um, it came around a certain time in India's history where there was a need for that or perceived need for that kind of a platform. And it is now the most widely watched channel in the country. Um, so then you have to ask, okay, was there an ed audience for it or was there uh, an audience was created for it? And then there is a commercial argument. We, we've seen those WhatsApp chat, uh, chats about, you know, uh, ratings. Um, in the poor chap was in, in prison also for that, but that's a different story. Um, and then there is a kind of political dimension to that in the sense that it also promotes a particular kind of agenda. Uh, I would say very effectively. So um, this is, you know, and, and in, in a country like ours, there is also a uh, an issue about what some scholars would call lit media literacy. We do not, we have had, we, we've had this very interesting shift from, say, illiteracy or semi-literacy to a visual culture. We have missed out on the literacy bit. A lot of us have missed out. So um, they are not, and it's not an elitist view, I think it's a very uh, kind of common sense view in a manner of speaking, that we have um, had a generation which had had no or very little experience of uh, reading or, you know, slightly deeper understanding of the world or country or society. And they moved into this TikTok and Twitter generation and they don't have, I see that in my students, the way they write their essays. And I'm not just from Hong Kong, in London I've seen it. The, 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 the limitations of their argumentation is, is an indication of how much they read or what they read or what they watch, more important, rather than read. So I think it's a, you know, it's a multi-dimensional um, question and I, I, I've tried to give you a multi-dimensional answer. 
because this is a very very important point actually because you know how do you um, what is the what is the perception of the audience and what is the audience's uh, you know view of the the producers and that dynamic is very very complex um, the other thing I would say just finally in that is that now um, because of the the uh, communication environment within which this takes place um, there is also no time or very little time for any deep reflection you have to be if you've got 30 seconds on television able to say something which may sound very banal but you could shout it out <laughs> so, uh, and then audiences are reacting there's tweets and and, and just imagine when uh, a billion people have uh, uh, better quality phones and uh, you know so how are we going to deal with that information economy it would be an interesting um, speculation to make and that's coming it's a matter of time may i request mansi to uh, handle the take over the student questions there are a couple of questions in the chat yeah. box i would take uh, some which we haven't covered in the session so the first one goes uh, talking of international communications one thinks about world peace we have we have observed that there is worldwide solidarity on social media for any terrorist activity or any other inhumane activity which happens in a particular region does this actually affect the geopolitical strategies of the countries in conflict um thank you that's a very important question actually one should make a little distinction between international communication and global communication so international communication really is intergovernmental communication governments do matter and if you look at what i was saying i was really focusing on big powers governments big corporations etc um, when we speak of global communication we're talking about um, civil society you know, ordinary people like you and me and how we communicate and how we create a kind of um, global public sphere uh, whether it is environmental issues with terrorism related issues uh, a, a prominent example of that would be uh, the, you know, Black Lives Matter uh, in the United States and how it becomes a global phenomena or Me Too movement. And you might say, well, that also shows that the hegemony exists and that, you know, if it's an American story, it becomes a global story, etc. But it has given that space for uh, providing a kind of, uh, you know, people's view uh, in, in, in an increasingly globalized world. How much it affects policy, I remain a bit skeptical. Because, you know, when um, the US government was um, had decided to bomb Iraq in 2003, the largest uh, anti-war demonstrations that you could imagine happened in major cities in Europe, including, including in London. Did that change the, 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 the course of war? They, they had planned it in weeks in advance. You don't do that in one day. They're not like Indians, they're very well organized people. So it's, it's all done in, you know, in meticulous detail. So these guys are shouting, it's fine, it doesn't matter. So, I mean, that's a very cynical view too, but I think that's a very realistic view, I would say. So they do matter, but only to a certain extent. The next question is, with the advent of many independent media platforms that are directly or indirectly public funded, how do you think that has an impact on public perception on political communication? Thank you. So we mean public funded, not government. You mean like Janta, right? I, I think it means uh, uh, government funded. I think it means government funded. Okay. So, but there's also, I think the more interesting question is the, the you know, crowdsourced uh, organizations or, or you know, uh, groups with associated with certain communities. Um, and now with those platforms which are free, there is actually a very interesting, um, you know, a cluster of opinion emerging and perhaps in a small way, influencing political communication. Although um, some of the problem with that kind of communication is also what is called the sort of echo chamber, you know, di dimension, in the sense that you're talking to the converted, talking to people who think like you. So you are really, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of um, making the, di the discourse more uh, kind of polarized than before. 
Um, that's the danger. But on the plus side, it is, uh, you know, offering a, a lot of um, alternative perspectives and increasingly democratizing communication. And it's not just confined to nation states, it's happening at a transnational level. And that's one of the empowering potentials of, of this new uh, digital age. Um, so that's, you know, uh, I, I do, it's, it's, it's very difficult to say, you know, it's all great or say it's all bad. It's, it's a mixture. There are aspects of it which are remarkably good. And there are aspects which are, uh, you know, problematic. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is by a student. Uh, she asks, what is the difference in media education in England versus in India? In where? In, in England versus India. Oh. So my question will be, why should we compare ourselves with, with England? We should compare ourselves with Nigeria, with Indonesia, with China, and then see where we stand. Right? This is something which one has to get over. This is fundamental. America may as out of the way, America up, nay, you way up in the stand, in the stand with the hook, or can you? Right? So, this is we, we have these reference points. London make a hota, or America make a hota. They're Beijing make the hook, yaki on one. They were poorer than us. In, in, I, I quoted in my, several of my books, I mentioned this in 1991, they were. 700 million people living in extreme poverty in China. Extreme poverty means two dollars a day. India mein us samay 300 million garib the. So they had double the number of what we had. So they've done it. Hum abhi bhi jahan, we are still fighting with that. So somebody has to ask, okay, maybe there is something wrong with our approach. Maybe we are listening too much to the World Bank. We are listening too much to Oxford professors. Maybe we need to go and talk to somebody in Shanghai. Yeah, tumne kaise kiya? Tum to gawar the. Tum to peasants the. Tumne kaise kar diya? Tum 5G mein kaise aa gaye? Ham kyun nahi aa paaye? Hamara data tumhare paas kaise? Why isn't your data with us? I was just watching those visuals the other day about uh, 26th of December, yeah, jo January, iska Gantan Divas wala, and I was thinking, yeah, what kind of crowd control is this? In the capital of India, few miles from where the prime minister lives, how, how are these guys not trained? You know, and, and how do you get into Red Fort where there is army there, right? Used to be. I don't know where they have removed it now. But there used to be army there, and we take it casually. Ho gaya nahi, kuch nahi hua. <laughs> anyway, that's a longer discussion some of the time. So I, I, I would say that, you know, that's that my response would be do not compare yourself with these countries because they have not only, you know, um, they've been doing this for such a long time and there are aspects for that we should learn from. Um, so they have, you know, the um, media education is has been there for a very long time, whether at school or university level, there is this very, very important um, culture of public service broadcasting, which is not commercial, which is uh, which does work, which is for public interest. And, you know, if people grow up with that kind of culture, we used to have a Durdarshan long time ago. But, uh, you know, today we have a very different media. So that's also part of media education. If you are being exposed to a very uh, toxic kind of narrative, uh, then there is a problem. How, you know, how do you see the country and the world? Um, so UK has lots of these advantages that we don't have yet. Any questions from you, Mansi? Sir, I would like to ask you that if anyone would like to do a PhD under your guidance, what would be the process and you know how to go about with the applications? Well, you know, the, one of the good things about Hong Kong is that um, they are really well resourced. The universities have um, uh, resources. And although it is technically part of China, but it has its own autonomy. So, so far, you know, I haven't, uh, nobody has told me what I should teach and what I should write so far. I don't know. Um, so, you know, you just have to, uh, you can send me the details. I can send you, I'll connect you to a person who deals with, uh, the, you know, uh, so the, the, so the point is, if you want to come or anybody wants to come, they have to be, uh, you know, 
in a kind of fellowship program so you get because it's an expensive city to live um, so without scholarship it will be difficult and uh, they, they, they actually want more students from uh, other countries because um, you know they get lots of mainlanders so they're keen on most more students so it's straightforward you apply and uh, if you get a um, I mean, even if you don't get a scholarship, you can get an admission. Admission shouldn't be a problem, but depends on what you want to do. And, uh, you know, uh, I'll be very happy to to consider any application. So. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, do we have any more questions from the professors? Or any uh, professors? I I, if I can just go back to the book. One last question, oh. Dr. Tusu. Yes, okay. uh, which is your book is on the BRICS, and right. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Yeah. So, uh, uh, my question is: when we talk about regional bodies like the BRICS, SARC, ASEAN, BIMSTEC, do you foresee these organizations coming up with their own sort of avenues of communication? Because nothing much moves. True. You know it very well, better than me, I'm sure. That they meet, eat, dine, wine and they go back home, yeah. do nothing much. So do they need to have a channel of their own where all these uh, stakeholder countries come up with their prospective trade and commerce or political or cultural agenda to drive home the point that we need to be together and need to do business yeah. in a sustainable environment? Uh, that, thank you. That's, again, very, very good question. Actually, you know, if you think of the BRICS, uh, which I can speak about um, it emerged after the 2008 economic crisis uh, and it was actually a Russian project which was then uh, kind of appropriated by the Chinese because they they wanted to tell the world look we are not the only rising power there is other powers which are rising so don't be worried about it. so essentially they took it over and uh, you know these are very diverse countries very different. India is as different from China as you can imagine, right? Brazil is very different from South Africa. You know, Russia is. So they're very different countries. One thing which sort of connects them is they are large uh, non-Western countries, although Russia, you can argue whether it's European or not. But <laughs> um, And they do have distinct worldviews, certainly in case of Russia, China and India. South Africa was added because the Chinese wanted them to be there. They are not in the same league as the other four. So there is actually, one of the, I mean, this is the third book we've done. There is actually a whole book we did on journalism in, in these countries. And there was first book in 2015, which was called Mapping BRICS Media. And there was a chapter in that book which looked at the kind of intra-BRICS media exchange. And the people who wrote it, it was the most difficult chapter to write because there's actually very little intra-BRICS uh, you know, exchange. So, um, you know, so, so if you if you think of um, what we read about China in India is mostly from Western sources. I mean, although there are some correspondents in Beijing, I don't know whether they still exist, but there were a few before. Uh, same with China, they have very limited a number of people here. And the BRICS, the future of BRICS will really depend on what happens in India and China. Because if they have, um, the, the tension is okay, but if they get to the next level of escalation, then this will break up. And in any case, they have, uh, you know, Chinese priorities that are now into BRI and all that. So BRICS is not most important. Right? But it is still a useful forum uh, as a geopolitical forum. But in terms of its uh, media role, cultural role, actually that's very limited. So it's more a normative thing. It should be like that. There should be a kind of group of countries who can challenge the domination. But, you know, uh, in reality, if you think about it, all these five countries, their most important partner is the United States. Yeah, absolutely. So the relationship India has with the U.S., for instance, is so much more complex, you know, in terms of um, just people to people connection. Every middle class home in India has somebody who works or studies in the U.S. You can't say that about Russia or China. Same for China. Same. For, so I think there is that, is that com complication. It is a, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting idea, but how much it will be, uh, you know, in how much difference it will make in terms of media understanding is, uh, is, um, is open to, to debate because there's very little 
Uh, and if India China, as I said, if that relation gets worse, then it will cease to be uh, of any importance. Not even summits will take place. Um, thank you so much for that response. Thank you. I think we'll take one last question from Professor Shubhrajit Ganguly, and then we can. Hello, sir. Am I, am I clearly audible? Yes. Uh, sir, last year in April, during April, there was a merger between Geo and Facebook, Reliance Geo and Facebook. Reliance Geo right now, one of the biggest service providers in this country. On the other end, if you see the database of Facebook, it's huge. And this year, 8th February onward, WhatsApp is also changing its privacy policies. So yeah. uh, I have two questions, rather two concerns. First, uh, Geo is actually heading towards this uh, monopolistic market in India. Uh, they are not providing any other option for the users. That is the first question that is it actually going towards the monopolistic market and if it happens then what will going to happen? Second is the inbidding the privacy. If we see that Geo, uh, sorry, WhatsApp is actually following the Google AdWord kind of a model that whatever we will be discussing among ourselves, those keywords will be tracked and you will see those particular advertisement on Facebook. So this is again uh, in vision of, in, of privacy. So don't you think this is challenging the business ethics in the digital space? Of course, absolutely. And I think that's one of the, it's the whole oligarchy kind of thing. You know, there is, you've got uh, a few companies which, um, but the point is, is it better that there is an Indian company which is paying taxes in India which is in control of our data or is it an american company which is utterly unaccounted for anybody so at least you could say okay five years time modi isn't there someone else is there and we could say okay you know this guy is horrible we should get rid of uh, mr reliance is you know we need this is cap this is monopolism etc etc there is a possibility that something might happen right that's one of the advantages of democracy you can but you can't do anything about um, these the global players. So that would be my argument. That is, is, is the lesser evil of the two, in my view. And I think you do need some kind of um, scale and scope to be able to provide that connectivity that India needs. And I think for that you need a lot of resources. And then you know there's also talk about. Um, whole electronic economy and we're talking about trillions of dollars of financial market, etc. That that you know that kind of um, semi-urban rural India, which is a hugely undertapped market in India, and I think Reliance understands that better than the Tatas of the world because they come from a, a different kind of social background. Uh, I think it's also true of Modi and Ra Rahul Gandhi. The difference is also sociology is very important in that. You know, if you come from below, you understand the complexity of the country. And I think my sense is I'm no I'm no expert on this. Um, so the privacy issues there, of course, privacy issues also with uh, you know Google, with with uh, Facebook, with the WhatsApp. If you remember when Aadhaar was introduced, there was a lot of debate about middle class people. Our data is being and just imagine there was no Aadhaar and, and this had happened, uh, COVID had happened, what would have uh, been the fate of millions of Indians? You know, they all this direct transfer of money and maybe chori hoti hai. I'm not saying it's not it's perfect, but it is less chori than what was before. Rahul, Rahul, Rajiv Gandhi famously said that 80% of government aid goes to middlemen. So out of the rupee, 80 pence is stolen. So I think there's something to be said in that in, in favor of that. I don't want to sound a kind of you know pro-market guy, but I think there is there is something which is uh, kind of as I said before, the kind of balance is required. You need certain systems um, to, to regulate the abuse of that power, which is likely if you have monopolistic, you know, monopolistic control. Um, and and Geo is, as you say, Geo is on that path. It's already got, um, you know, basically is the kind of running the show as it were for. But also media. Think of think of the with the control they have of different media outlets. It's it's a remarkable. Um, so they are basically I mean the five G technology which is upcoming. I mean. Yeah. Yes, I mean that. So that's the next stage because he he said very clearly that we're going to have our own systems in place. He also said, which is interesting, I don't know how far it's going to happen, 
he did say that we're going to invest in Kashmir. Yes. So, save to na Kashmir. So, banayega data center. Climate is right for that. If you think of India, where else would you do it? So they are not these are very clever people. You know, let's not underestimate Indians. They're very clever people. We just need a good government, half decent government. Ho jayega. Half decent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you, you for Daya for that hope. Thank From you. outside, you can give us hope and you can give us confidence, especially to the younger generation. No, I mean, go we, forward. we are we are we are the future. I say to all young people, you are the future of the world. The, 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 you know, we, we are, despite all the IMF Karaki will be at 11% next year. Now, that's not a small figure, right? Let's not, let's not, we, we have this tendency to kind of, we, we, we kind of vacillate. Either we are like greatest in the world or we're the worst in the world. Balance, we have, we've got lots of good things, lots of bad things. You know, and given the, the, the kind of complex country we are, I mean, the, there's no other place like that on the planet. Such diversity, such you know, inequality, so many problems, um, you know. But then we we survived. Oxford professor has been saying for the last fifty years, "This is artificial creation. Hey, this break up will be done. You know, it, quite the reverse has happened. Quite the reverse has happened. Same. Think about China. They were saying, "This is massage figures. They can't. They can't trust them. They can't. 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 So then you have to ask him, Kiska, kya pad rahe hum? who is influencing our mind? Maybe we should look at somewhere else. And I think that's so India may week Swadeshi discourse either. That is really, really important. And unlike other countries, we actually have a very, very old and sophisticated tradition of that. We don't have to invent one. Just go back to what you know Tagore was saying, what uh Sri Arbundo was saying, way back, you know, a hundred years ago. So what the koi aapko naya invent ni karna. Unlike many other developing countries, they have nothing, unfortunately. What are dependent on Anyway, so that's that's later discussion, maybe some other time we should have. Yes, we that. will surely have you. Yes, Mansi, please close this day's proceedings. Thank you so much, sir, for your enlightening words. And I'm sure it has been an eye opener for all of us here present here. We look forward to having such sessions with you very often. And uh, thanking uh, Dr. Banerjee and Dr. Bakshi for their encouragement and constant support. We look forward to seeing you all in our next webinar in the Media Song Frater series. Thank Till you. then, uh, do take care and stay safe. Thank you thank so you, much. Thank you. And same to you guys also. Thank you for hosting me. It's lovely. Thank you.